It's Blissin Up. I'm your host, Rachel Lang, intuitive astrologer. Get starstruck with inspiring guests and engaging conversations. Blissin Up starts now. Hello and welcome. This is Rachel Lang, and you are listening to and watching Blissin Up. And I am broadcasting live today from the Conscious Life Expo, which is this big festival of healers and, um, and, and, and people dedicating their lives to making a difference in the world through raising consciousness. And, uh, and so it's, it's really exciting. We're going to be here all weekend. In fact, I am actually broadcasting a show tomorrow night with um, a really exciting guest, a Mayan astrologer. So he's going to be here with me tomorrow night at 6 p.m. And all weekend long, UBN radio hosts are going to be uh, broadcasting their shows from this space. So um, if you are in the Los Angeles area, you need to come down to the LAX Hilton and check out some of the festivities and some of the talks and panels going on this weekend. And, and you might even see some of us walking around. So, um, so I'm really excited about that. And I'm also excited about our show today. Um, since the beginning of 2016, we have, we have been talking about this year of transition. Beginnings and endings and movement. We had a numerologist, Gail Minogue, on telling us what was significant about a nine year and what we could expect. And this was a big theme in that discussion. Um, we also witnessed in the very beginning of the year several losses of, of some of the celebrities that, that we love. and and. And, and losses from cancer. Um, we also had President Obama appointing Joe Biden to spearhead an initiative to cure cancer. So cancer has been one of those things that's been up for us in the news. And when, uh, when John and I spoke about, about this subject um, in the very beginning of the show, we, we thought how fun, it, how, how fun, how inspiring and how incredible it would be to have someone on talking about how do you survive cancer? Um, how you know what what is the spiritual what are spiritual practices that you can employ if you're caring for someone um, who is undergoing treatment for cancer? How do you handle loss? And 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 those themes also present themselves in in any in any life crisis that we're going through that we're experiencing. So um, so I have invited uh, Dr. Susan Mecca, who's a psychologist and author and a, and an organizational consultant and just an incredible, an incredible um, uh, person with rich insight and wisdom about how to navigate the process of, of caring for someone who, who is recovering from, from cancer um, and also uh, uh, any, managing any life, life crisis. So um, she actually cared for her son, Nick, and her husband, Vito, as each one of them underwent cancer treatments. And she believes that supporting a loved one during this time of crisis evolves into a transformational process that actually heals and changes the self. So we welcome her on the show today, and she'll share her wisdom and her insights and tell us a little bit about her forthcoming book. So, um, so that I'm really excited about that. And I'm always here, supported and, and blessed with the presence of John Williams. Oh, honey, thank hi. you. Hi. Hi, John. Hi, hi. Uh, so it's very interesting. We're, we're broadcasting live here from the LAX Hilton at, at the Conscious Life Expo, and uh, we have all kinds of planes that are flying by, so you're going to hear that in the background. Well, <laughs> it, it, kind of move, it kind of works with our theme of yeah. movement, yeah, right? Sure movement does. and change. Yeah. Going from one place to another. And actually, that coincides very nicely with the pictures that we're going to talk about for our full moon coming up this next week. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. In our Starstruck segment, which we should go into right now. All right. Let's get Starstruck. <laughs> Starstruck is a segment of our show where we talk about what's happening astrologically this week so that you can make the most of each day. And we start this week weekend moving it with this, the moon moving into fiery, passionate, lively Leo. And when the moon's in Leo, we all, I know I do, I, I, I do, but I think most of us want to get dressed up. We want to get out of the house. We want to go out and play. Um, it's also a great time for indulging in any kind of cultural events, music, theater, art, um, hosting friends and gatherings, social gatherings, having parties, um, you know, going on 
you know, phenomenal date nights. Uh, this whole weekend is going to be filled with that energy. And it starts tonight um, at 6.18 Pacific time. And, and this is especially going to be powerful for our, our fire signs, Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. You're gonna feel this one the most. And our Libras and Geminis are too. Um, you know, any of our signs that, that really, uh, that, that love to, to, to go out, to love to socialize, that, are, that are, tend to be more outgoing, this is going to be a, a great start for the weekend for you. Um, then the sun's in Pisces too. So we have the moon in Leo. In, in fiery fixed Leo and the sun in Pisces, which is the, the sign of creativity and inspiration and, um, and, and, and vision and dreams. And so our water signs, Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces, um, this would be a great time for you to, to go out and soak up some inspiration, whether that's going to the beach and, and soaking up the rays of the sun or, uh, or that's you know, going to an art exhibit, going to, uh, to some kind of a, a musical show. Um, it's a great time for that. Uh, our fixed signs, Taurus, Scorpio, Leo, and Aquarius. Now, tomorrow, you kind of have this stick to your guns mentality. And, 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 and I, I, want, I want to just sort of, of give you a little bit of caution about this influence. Because, it, because uh, often, um, in, the, in the morning, if you have that, if you have that energy, that that kind of that kind of stuck, stubborn energy, um, you could create some tension that will that will get your weekend off to kind of a rough start. So practice a little gentleness. Slow down. Relax. Don't get into any kind of heavy, you know, conversations or heavy discussions until the afternoon, when that stubbornness and that kind of that kind of like it's my way, you know, sort of mentality, when that sort of passes over a little bit and subsides and eases, and you have a little bit more grace. So, um, uh, so this is going to be especially like after like. 12, 12 o'clock, afternoon, anytime in the afternoon that opens up and, and you find ways to dialogue where in the morning you might not have. Um, on Sunday, we have a real desire to reach out to others, to connect and, um, and to support one another, especially if, if, if you're going through some kind of a, of a healing process. This is a time to really gather, uh, gather together in, in small, small intimate conversations. Um, it's also a great day to call that family member who seems to drive you crazy or you don't necessarily see eye to eye because I think what the opportunity here is, it, there's an opportunity, the, blah, I can't even talk, <laughs> there's an opportunity in this circumstance uh, on, uh, under the influence of this day to really foster a sense of understanding um, where there might not have been one before. Um, it's also a great day Sunday to work in the garden, to volunteer for a charity, um, to do some self-nurturing, like a spa day, or um, you know, going going out and uh, and and having coffee with a good friend. Uh, it's a great day to kind of make some connections that that really support you. Um, then on Monday, Monday's the highlight of our week, John. The highlight of our week. Yes, it's the highlight of our week. Do you know what's you know what Monday is? No. <gasps> It's a full moon. Oh. It's a Virgo Pisces full moon. Oh. Yes. Our Even better. I know. I know. <laughs> our, our moon is going to be full at three degrees of Virgo. And that's a degree. You know, everyone knows I love Sabian symbols. They offer us images for that can, can kind of bring us into a story about what the day or what the degree is about. And so, and so our, our, our vision for Monday is the image of, a ch of children of different races playing together happily. And the other vision is car traffic on an isthmus between two seashore resorts. And so the way that I interpret this is that the full moon reminds us that we are in transit, that we are moving into different cycles, life cycles, we're moving into different seasons. We have different destinations that we're moving from and moving toward. And this occurs in every single, every single aspect of our lives and it occurs throughout our lives in different ways. Our purpose continues to evolve. We can continue to, to, to seek newer, um, newer ways of being. We seek new opportunities, new jobs, new relationships, um, all, of those kinds of, all of those kinds of things, practically and spiritually. And by connecting with one another, 
and breaking down the barriers of fear that keep us separate from one another, we can support one another in moving forward, in reaching those destinations, even if that means that, that we have to look beyond the surface, that we have to break down the exterior, and we have to connect on, on a heart level, like children do when they're playing. Innocence, um, you know, freedom, a sense of, 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 uh, of playfulness, um, anything that kind of breaks up some of those structures and the rigidity that, 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 that we fall into um, throughout, the, throughout our lives. So, um, so Pisces is the, where the sun is, that's the, that's the sign the sun is in. And Pisces is about spirituality, creativity, transcendence beyond boundaries, um, beyond limiting structures and, and, and stuck fixed beliefs. And Virgo, the sign of Virgo, invites us to look at our homes, our spaces, look at our immediate environments, and look at our bodies, and, and, and ask ourselves, is, am, am I structuring my life? Are the details of my life supporting my spirit, supporting my gifts, my contribution to the world? Virgo is about selfless service, and it's about giving back in a way that, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't command attention. It's not ego-driven, it's driven from the heart. So it's discerning, it's precise, it's definite action. So on a practical level, this is a great time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, to clean the house, to look around your space, in and out of your closets, go into those drawers, those junk drawers, uh, look under your bed, what needs to go? By clearing your house, you open up energetic space in your life. Um, and on Monday and Tuesday, you might also think about doing this in terms of your body. It's a great, it, these are great days for a detox or some kind of a cleanse. Um, also great for getting out and exercising. Uh, our mutable signs, Virgo, Pisces, Gemini, and Sagittarius, you're gonna feel the most influenced by, this, by, this, by, these, by these influences. Uh, um, and, uh, and, 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 and so there's a, a great, you know, I think because Virgo emphasizes selfless service, this is also a good time to clean out and, and donate used items, gently used items and, and things to your favorite charity um, and to do something to, to help other people. Um, whether they're, you know, a, a charitable organization or people in your life. Um, the power of the full moon and the moon in Virgo will last until Wednesday, and then the moon enters Libra Wednesday afternoon, and our attention turns to connecting, to connecting with one another. Libra is a sign of harmony, balance, partnership. And uh, under this influence, you know, it's a great time for a date night. It's a great time to spend quiet, you know, interaction with someone that you really deeply care about. Um, or that special someone in your life. Um, our air signs, Libra, Gemini, and Aquarius, will feel this influence the most. Um, Wednesday and Thursday are excellent with this influence for negotiations and business partnerships. If you've been trying to close a deal and you feel like you, you haven't been able to, to completely sync up, this is a great time to, to finalize those details and to to get the things signed. So um, really, really favorable for, for, for those kinds of things, uh, it, those kinds of business interactions. Um, our, our, our air signs, it's an excellent time for t coming together in celebration too, for having a party, for having some kind of a social gathering. Fire signs, this, is, it, this goes for you as well. The Venus influences of these days highlight socializing and connecting. So, Wednesday, get out. Thursday, get out and play with your friends. Um, and that leads us into Friday, which we'll talk about next week. So that was Starstruck. That is an overview of this week. We're going to take a really short break. And when we come back, we'll be speaking with Dr. Susan Mecca. So stay tuned. Welcome back. You're tuned into Listen Up. And I'm Rachel here. Uh, with Dr. Susan Mecca, who is a psychologist um, who has her PhD in counseling psychology and she has an MBA as well. Dr. Mecca is a psychologist, an author, and an organizational consultant. Um, and, and she works with individuals and organizations. She's also the widow of a retired Navy vet veteran who, who passed away from cancer and the mother of a 26 year old son who survived cancer. Uh, Susan believes that we all have the potential to use crisis and challenges in our lives to be better than we were before. So welcome Dr. Dr. Susan Mecca. 
Thank you. It's delighting to be I'm delighted to be here today. Oh, uh, it's so great. And to I love that you. song. I love that song you were playing, Rachel. That was so cool. <laughs> well, you know, I always play music that um, that relates, like where the artist is. It, it, it seals birthday today. So he's a uh -huh. Pisces, and it's his birthday. So um, so oh. yes. So it's, it was I, perfect. I, I thought so too. I thought so too. So um, so first of all, um, I think. If we could, if we could hear a little bit about your story and 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 what you experienced um, that that sort of led to your in, the inspiration for your book. Absolutely. So uh, back in it was it was actually September two thousand five. My sixteen year old son came and sat down next to me while I was reading and said, "Mom, I think I have testicular cancer." Now Nick is a Leo and he's pretty solid Leo. So he has a flair for the dramatic. And I thought, yeah, well, maybe, you know, probably not. So unfortunately I was wrong and he had non-long Hodgkin's lymphoma. We were really lucky that he caught it very early. It was a stage one. Um, but at that moment, my family went from sort of a, a basically normal family, mostly okay marriage, you know, one, one dog, one cat, you know, one kid. And we went from a family that had nothing stronger than Benadryl in our medicine cabinet to a family that had chemo drugs at the dinner table. I mean, it absolutely threw us into a place that neither of us had ever imagined going and didn't have a clue um, what that looked like. And yet, interestingly enough, and I'll talk more about this, it was on the heels of me doing a lot of travel around the country and around the globe talking about intentionality. And in some ways that it felt like a big wake up call. Mm. But we got, we started to get Nick through cancer. He went through horrible, um, horrible mucositis. He went down to 80 pounds, was in the hospital for three weeks. And he had just come home and started to recover when my husband, who was a very, very healthy 66 year old, started complaining of pain. I took him into the hospital and he didn't come out for nine months. Wow. He was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre, which is a neurological disease. And he went from being completely healthy to being on a feeding tube and um, a respirator. Um, so it was a huge shock. I had one child going through chemo. I had a husband in ICU. Um, and nine months later, he came home in a wheelchair. And so everything was thrown up in the air. Um, we got Nick off to college because he was doing really pretty well at that point. And he had to come home two months later because Vito had been diagnosed with cancer. Um, Vito went through 13 months. He did everything he could to buy time to stay with us. But 13 months later, he died. And so in the space of almost exactly three years from the diagnosis of Nick's chemo, uh, Nick's cancer to Vito's death, my family went through pretty, pretty big amounts of health. And I, at the time, you said, how did the book come about, Rachel? At the time, it was interesting. I just did what made sense. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, everything that I did just sort of made sense to me. And I don't think I realized at the time that I was drawing on years of experience of being a therapist as well as somebody who had studied psychology and had really been, um, had a pretty deep spiritual faith. It wasn't until after Vito died that my friend said, you know, you really need to write a book about this. You you took three, you know, multiple gut punches one after another, and you kept standing, and you and you stayed whole, and you helped your son stay whole. How did you do it? And so that's how the book came about. Is like, I guess I did know some stuff, and maybe I could share it with other people. Right, right. What were what were some of the? I'm, I'm, I just I I can't even imagine what that experience must have been like. What were some of the aha moments that you had during that time? That, um, that helped you get through it? Yeah, I think I had what I would call two core beliefs. And they, you know, I, I call those sort of put up or shut up. I'd already, I had always believed this, but it wasn't until I got faced with it that I had to find out that I really believe it. You know, it's easy to say mm -hmm. it. It's easy to talk the talk, but when you have to walk the walk, it becomes a, oh yeah, I really do believe this. And those two core beliefs were that I had, I could choose who I would be even in the worst of times, mm -hmm. and that I absolutely had that choice within me to make that decision. And the second one was that good would come from this, that I absolutely believed, as hard as it was, that our family would be blessed in some ways in this time of horrible crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and do, you, do, you, do you feel that, that, your, that those core beliefs 
sort of provide a structure for you within which you could kind of move forward in caring for these? You know, people? yeah, that's a really great question, um, Rachel. I believe it absolutely did because well, after Nick was diagnosed, I sent out an email to people and said, I'm going to be focused, present, and positive. Mm. And those were the three things that I said as an intention. And, and focused and present was particularly important for me because I have a um, a well-known disease that I have other friends that suffer from. It's called Debso, distracted easily by shiny objects. Okay. Um, <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> well, just that I have a tendency to get sort of distracted by things. It's like, oh, look, shiny object. Let me go after that. <laughs> and I knew that if I was really going to help Nick through this process, because he was, of course, the one going through it first, I needed to be very focused on him and mm -hmm. what he needed and then what our family needed. Mm -hmm. And so putting that out there to my friends help them know how to support me. This is, I set an intention. This is who I'm going to be. And when I got really upside down and, and trust me, I got upside down lots of times, it became a bit of a true North for me to be able to go back to, you know, I, I'm, I'm mad. I'm mad at this nurse, or I'm mad that this is happening or I'm scared. Okay. So I said, I was going to be focused, present and positive. What can I do right now that allows me to do that? Mm -hmm. Because you know, you don't have control when, when cancer happens to your family. You have very little control out, out of the, the course of what happens. You have some, but you don't have much. But you have complete control over yourself. Right, right. But, but was it hard to feel like you had control when you were going through your own emotional ups and downs? Absolutely. Um, you know, what I did that was helpful to me is that I sort of, I, I knew as being a psychologist that I couldn't stuff the feelings but I also knew that Nick needed to see me as calm and in control. Mm -hmm. you know, he was going to get, I, in some ways, I was like the pilot in, in turbulence. You know, when the, when, the hair, when the airplane hits turbulence, the first thing you're looking at is the pilot of the, of the flight attendant to find out, do they look freaked out? Or are they just going, oh, yeah, it's turbulence, no big deal. And so Nick was going to look at me to figure out whether or not I was freaked out. He's, he's always been a barometer. And so I knew I had to stay positive. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would, I would cry at night in the shower or I would go work out and I would cry on the way back. And it was like I needed, to, I needed to feel those feelings, but I also needed to stay focused on what was right for my son. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was very important to me, that I'd be the mom he needed me to be. Mm -hmm. So during this time, too, your husband, you're also caring for your husband. So Yeah, it was... And that was a huge shock because Vito was like, you know, was I was a little bit of the flaky one, at least at that point in my life, I've become much less flaky because um, I had to. But he was the, the absolute rock. He was the one who paid all the bills on time. He was the one who made sure everything happened in the house. I mean, he was 20 years, retired Navy. The man was the most organized human being I'd ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And now he was completely paralyzed and incapable of doing anything. And so I had to pick up those reins as well. Um, and that was a little rocky for a while. Mm -hmm. Now, well, especially because your husband, you expect your husband to be sort of that support system for you. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you, you mentioned just a few minutes ago that you really relied on your friends for like as a community of support. Um, was that, how did you, how did you build that network for yourself and, and how did it play a role in, in helping you? I actually think that's one of the most important strategies anybody can do when they are going through cancer or they have a family going through cancer is that I think you, you stop and think about who's my dream team. You know, if you're lucky like I was, I have not only amazing friends, I have amazing family members. I mean, they, would, they flew in, they helped out, they showed up, they called. Um, I'm really blessed with that family. But I also had a number of girlfriends and, and friends who were fellow psychologists people who connected me with other people. So part of what I set out pretty quickly to do was to connect with that, that community of support. And I did it through emails. Mm. I, I kept people apprised of what was going on. I told them, you know, here's, here's what's happening right now. Here's where we are. Um, here's what my family needs. And then I also in some ways got a, a real community of um, support by figuring out what did I need. Mm -hmm. I needed a medical, I needed a medical group of people, I needed emotional support, I needed logistical support, I needed, um, I needed spiritual support. And so some of that was actually friends and then some of it were some of the things that I did um, to actually help myself get through that. Like my spiritual community support was not only um, 
a little bit of the church that I went through, but it was actually calling on angels and it was doing angel cards and it was writing affirmations and it was listening for the divine and watching for um, signs of encouragement. So it wasn't just the sort of the, I don't know, the, the people that I could see, it was the, the spiritual community around me that it wasn't necessarily aware of mm-hmm. or that I couldn't see, I guess. Mm-hmm. And for, for Nick and Vito, did they have did they have a spiritual practice or a spiritual belief system that supported them while they were going through the treatments and, and while they were um, while they were experiencing the disease? No, neither of them really did. Nick was 16, and mm-hmm. so you know he was sort of he was trying to figure out what he believed at that period of time. And, and Vito was a recovering Catholic; had been um, had been a Catholic for part of his life, and that <laughs> for many people who experienced that it hadn't worked out for him. So he was all about, you know, what do I do to just get through this? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that was hardest for both of them is that they, they had a great community support in terms of friends and family. But, um, I think that that was a piece that they missed. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I talked to a CEO one time about it and he was saying, I don't know how you get through it without a spiritual basis. Mm -hmm. And, um, actually one of the things I did is I flew around the country talking to CEOs and federal court judges and and all governmental officials, people are very high up in their organizations to find out how they cope with it. And a large number of them called on their community, their spiritual community support to help them during that time. Mm-hmm. So if it's something that people have, I really recommend they find a way to really leverage that. Mm-hmm. What other step? What other things did you do for yourself? I'm putting the spotlight back on you. What other things did you do for yourself? to um, to survive that, that period of time? You know, the two hardest things for me, Rachel, were managing my mind monkeys. I have a very active mind that loves to come up with all kinds of terrible and dramatic scenarios. Obviously, that's where Nick gets his um, little bit of his flair. I'm Leo rising, so that's my excuse. <laughs> um, and the other thing that was really, um, that was, that I really had to, to, sort of pay attention to was putting on my own oxygen mask. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was when Vito was fine and he wasn't in the hospital, he made things happen. I mean, he took Nick to the doctor's appointment. I was there for all the really important procedures. I was there to spend the night with him in the hospital, but Vito made the other things happen. And when all of a sudden I was everybody, you know, luckily I was very blessed. My folks actually moved to town and helped out, helped with some of the watching over Nick and watching over Vito. Um, I had family that would fly in for a couple weeks at a time and help out. Um, but putting on my own oxygen mask was really, really hard. Mm-hmm. I think they were both it was sort of like the physical piece of putting on your own oxygen mask and the mental piece of managing the mind monkeys. Because when you have a loved one going through cancer and you've got an active imagination, um, it can be a really difficult process to shut down those mind monkeys. They have a tendency to love to show up at three o'clock in the morning when your defenses are low. Yes. Yes. Um, did you, did you, did you find ways to like divert your imagination or how, how do you, how do you tone down those voices? Yeah, I had a couple ways that really worked for me. The the first one is a little counterintuitive. Um, but it was a, it was an advice that I got early on and took. She said, one of my girlfriends, Diane, who's a very skilled consultant too, she said, you know, sometimes the mind monkeys need to just be faced. And so there was a period of time, as you can imagine, as a parent, the the biggest fear that kept running through my mind was, what if Nick died? Mm -hmm. And that was so terrorizing to me, just even thinking about it, that I spent a lot of time running from the thought. But finally, one day, I you know gathered up every single bit of courage that I had, and I looked at it, and I thought, okay, if Nick dies, if Nick, if this is not curable, can I be there through to the end with him? And I immediately knew that I could. Hmm. And the minute that I answered that question, the mind monkeys lost their power, because it was like, yeah, I can do this. If I have to, I can do this. And so that was one of the things that I did. The second one is, and I, I advise my clients to do this all the time, is I would schedule them. I'd schedule those little suckers because they were going to show up anyway. <laughs> That's and, great. And I would say, okay, you know what? <clears throat> you get to show up. I have space in my calendar for you from 9, from 9 to 9.30. I tried to do it while I was working out, if at all possible, because it was a lot easier to, to manage them. But if not, I'd schedule them for a certain time of the day, and I'd go, okay, have at it. 
and I would write down everything they had to say, you know, okay, yeah, got it. Uh-huh, yeah, well, what about the, yeah, okay, well, yeah, yeah, okay, fine, whatever, kept writing it down. And then at 9.15 or whatever time I gave it, I'd say, okay, you're done. And when they tried to show up for the rest of the day, I'd go, I'm sorry, you know what, thank you for, thank you for calling, but you need to come back at nine o'clock. Mm. And we call it in psychology, thought stopping. But what, what sort of cracked me up was to think about it as scheduling. And you know, I would have these little conversations with them. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you're not scheduled for right now. You need to come back. <laughs> That's great. That's such a great strategy. I love that. Yeah, it was really helpful. You know, it was like, uh, you know, I just, because I didn't want them to take over my whole day like some unruly throng of bratty children. Yes. You know, continuing to ask for my attention. It's like, no, I'm sorry. You're, you're not scheduled right now. Come back later. I have other things to do. Um, and I'm also a big believer in trashy romance novels. Okay, um, okay. Yeah. When that, and my friends would keep me completely, you know, stacked with them. And when things got really bad, I would just dry, dive into some trashy romance novel where I knew what the plot line was. I knew true love was going to win. And it would get me a little bit sort of distracted for a while. Um, drugs have always been my favorite. Uh, my, I mean, sorry. Books have always been my favorite say, drug of choice. Yeah, drugs have always drugs been my favorite good. book of choice. No. No, books have always been my favorite drug of choice. Yeah. And so that was one of my absolute best ways to, to manage mm. those mind monkeys, mm. little suckers. <laughs> That's great. I, I, I love that too because I think, you know, I, when I think about those kind of mind monkeys, I think about Saturn in, 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 in terms of uh, astrology. That's the voice of like, you know, the, the negative, like everything's going to go wrong. And, and, you know, Saturn doesn't love playfulness or, you know, entertainment or, uh, or love or romance or anything, anything like that. So, so I always, I always think about like, you know, about that, uh, like you're saying, reading those books and, and, and doing something that gets you out of that pattern can, can really help to, to make a difference. Yeah, it absolutely did. And then the oxygen mask, you know, one of the things that I did that was really helpful is that I, I had a lot of. Um, demanding and critical voices in my head, as often many of us do. And so I, I decided one day that I would recruit a compassionate voice in my head. Oh, wow. It's, yeah, it was really fun. So I decided I was going to find a compassionate voice. And it's it's really funny because she had shown up in a dream um, where Beto and I in the dream were stuck in a car and she came out of sort of nowhere. She was Italian. She's always five years older than I am. Her name is <laughs> Sophia. And she helped us get out of the rut. And so I thought, okay, well, this is clearly my compassionate voice. And so when I needed help, I would call on her and she would be the one who would like, you know, like this den mother, she would usher the the mind monkeys into another room. Like, oh, come on, no, you've done enough. Or if I was beating myself up saying, oh, I really need to pay the bills before I go to bed. She, it was her voice who would say, you know, Susan, you've really done enough today. Mm. Go to bed, have a glass of wine, go to bed, read a book, mm. you know, stop, you're okay. Mm. And it was just really helpful to have this image of this, you know, gorgeous, you know, um, Italian woman who just was both compassionate and lovely and wise to help me out through those times. That's so beautiful. So beautiful. Yeah. Now, I want to kind of transition to talking about after, after Vito's passed away, after Nick is... Nick has, has, has recovered, or he has, he's, he, he's, can't, he's kind of gone out of the, the, the difficult period of, of, um, of, of his cancer. What, what spiritual growth or what, 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 what ex- did you experience after, after this period in your life was, was finished? Yeah, and it's interesting. This, this ties into something called um, post-traumatic growth, and we've been studying it for a little while now. It's been around forever. In fact, Viktor Frankl, who I wanted to give credit to earlier, he's the guy who really inspired me. He was a neurologist and a psychiatrist during World War II who was Jew and was put into a concentration camp. Mm-hmm. And if you have never read his book, Man's Search for Meaning, it's yeah. absolutely it's worth so, reading. It's, be- oh, it's, it's so incredible. It was really it's amazing. It was really a powerful book. Yeah, it was for me. It was incredibly powerful for me. Mm-hmm. And so he um, he said in it, you know, you can take away all freedoms, but the last freedom, which is the ability to choose your attitude in any given set of circumstances. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that is sort of part of how what how I stayed tuned into who I wanted to be. And I think that by by starting off with who do I want to be during this, and and believing that good would come out of it, I think I set up the possibility for that good to be more more visible to me. I think good comes from many people. In fact, 30 to 70 people who go through a traumatic situation 
will report some form of spiritual growth or some kind of growth in their life. Um, in fact, you know, Oprah has a great quote that she loves. She says, turn your wounds into wisdom. Mm, I like that. And so I think part of the process for me was writing the book and looking back on what I had done and reflecting on it. This whole process of journaling has always been helpful to me. And I think that I'll tell you what the five were, and then I'll tell you sort of how they impacted me. Okay. Five ways people experience um, post-traumatic growth is the first one is typically a, a greater appreciation of love, of life, greater compassion, greater empathy. And I saw that particularly with both Nick and me. It's like, you know, my immediate response when somebody says they've got, they have a loved one going through cancer, they're going through cancer, it's this, tell me how I can be helpful. You know, because you have this sense of I know what you're going through at some level and I don't know what you need, but I know that I'm I'm willing and I'm not scared by it and I can step into it. So I think a, a significantly greater sense of empathy. I saw this with Nick, um, a, a friend of a friend's 13 year old daughter was diagnosed with leukemia and Nick immediately went over there and spent time with her and he told her about the process and he. And then, of course, being a teenager, he said, and the coolest thing about it is the cancer gifts. Because he <laughs> said, people give you all kinds of cool stuff because you got cancer. Uh. <laughs> but it was like this immediate for him that he was he wanted to step out there and help. Um, and I think that's the same thing for me is I've always been, I've had a big compassion meter, but I think it just really went off the charts when I went through that. Mm -hmm. um, the second one is a different perspective of life and purpose. And, and Nick and I have this thing that we say to each other. It's like, if nobody's dying and nobody's got cancer, it's just not that big of a deal. Mm. And it's given us this, you know, bad stuff happens. Nick's, you know, certainly continues to, to mourn the loss of his dad. Um, and, you know, it's very hard for him to be without his dad. But he has a perspective of life. And, in fact, Nick works with um, adolescents at this point at a residential treatment center. Oh, and wow. one of the Yeah, I know. How cool is that? He's That's gone back incredible. with his master's you know, to help become a therapist. Um, and so for him, he is, when he talks to these kids, he's got immediate street cred. You know, when they say, well, it's, you know, my parents took my phone away. He's like, yeah, you want to talk about what hard times are? Let's talk about chemotherapy. Oh, you know? uh, right, right. <laughs> um, the third one is, I think it's a, a spiritual development. And I think for me, it really... I've always had sort of a non-traditional faith in a family that's pretty traditional. Mm -hmm. And so it was never a completely, it was sort of an awkward fit for most of my life. And it really allowed me to consolidate that this faith was mine. It was real. And it, it got me through some really hard times in a way that just connected me more deeply with the divine. Mm -hmm. And so I think I claimed it in some ways that maybe I hadn't claimed before. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. The the fourth way is a greater appreciation of yourself. And I see this all the time with people um, who've gone through cancer or other really serious life illnesses, is that they sort of get they rock. I mean, when they look back on what they went through, they go, you know what? I'm pretty strong. I'm pretty resilient. You know, I didn't realize that I had these strengths. And in fact, one of the things I always tell people is look at your strengths because those are the things that are going to get you through cancer. Mm -hmm. Um one of my favorite stories is a, a guy who I talked to, um, and this guy's a who, he, his company was sold for like, I don't know, a billion dollars or whatever it was. But at the time he had testicular cancer, he had just started his company. And he's an ex-football guy and an ex-military um, uh, guy. And he was all about hit it hard, hit it hard, hit it hard. And so he said that was his mantra during cancer, was like he was on the football field, hit it hard, hit it hard. And he got through starting up a company and got through testicular cancer and has, you know, two beautiful children. Um, and to him, that sort of stayed with him is his ability in the worst of times to just hit it hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the last one that people have is be better relationships. And, you know, for me, Rachel, I, one of the things I had to admit was that I wasn't superwoman. Um, and apparently this was not a big shock to anybody else who knew me. Um, that I was not superwoman, but when I admitted it, I made the possibility of more vulnerability um, in a relationship. People, by asking for help and letting them help me and not try to do it all myself, which was sort of my tendency, mm -hmm. I think I really, I made better relationships possible. Right, right, because I think when you, when you open up 
I, I know for me, in, in the times of my life when I've had to be vulnerable, when I've been vulnerable and asked for support or reached out, it's, it breaks down the, any barriers or fears I've had to really achieving like intimate relationships or, or to being seen. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you can stay hidden and you can, and I saw this, some people go through cancer and they just sort of wrap themselves up into this tight little ball and, and I, no judgment because I think that's how they're getting through it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think that when you let yourself be helped by others during this time, it, it makes relationships amazing. And, you know, and I want to talk a little bit about the people and this, it, it, not everybody goes through this growth for some people it so completely destroys their sense of the world. They're so shaken by their vulnerability. They're so shaken by the possibility. You know, they've always felt like, well, I, if I live my life the right way, this is not going to happen to me. And they think, you know, I didn't deserve this. And, and nobody deserves cancer. And, you know, I know lots of people who've been incredibly healthy their entire lives, that everything right, who get cancer. And so, but for some people, it's such a huge shock that it sort of, I don't know, it, it sours their life. And to me, that's understandable, but incredibly sad yeah. that, that that's how they to. come out of this. Right, right, right. So, so shifting gears, what, mm -hmm. I want to hear about your book. What, what's, okay. what's the status of it? What's happening with it? Well, um, it's called The Gift of Crisis, Finding Your Best Self in the Worst of Times. Um, and it's a, been a labor of love over really about the last six or seven years. I worked on it. I got it done. I put it to one side. I got a great editor. We went through, she had some crises. It didn't escape my notice that she had crises while she was helping me do a book that had crises. <laughs> yeah. Spirit is spirits magic, isn't it? It just puts you people know, together right when they need it. Yeah. And then it's funny. I had somebody else who did a final edit on it and she said, oh my gosh, you know, this was like the perfect book to read because I'm going through this crisis with my mother and it's really helpful for me to have it. So it's been really sort of fun to see how Spirit has mm -hmm. used book, the book as it's gone along. And in fact, but I put it on the, the, the side for a while because I wanted to go do some other things. And where I am now is um, thanks to this incredibly skilled astrologer that I know named Rachel, um, who gave me some great advice about waiting until after April uh, April twelfth to go after a literary agent? I, not that she would remember this, but just I don't. Saying, I don't remember. <laughs> I know you don't remember. Um, I am just now starting the process of finding a literary soulmate, which is something else that you said to me that really resonated. You know, you said it's easy to look at this as a possibility of being rejected, but what if you if you looked at it as there's somebody out there who's made a soul contract with you to publish this book or to get this book to a publisher. And that's really resonated with me. Ooh, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna feeling emotional about that. That's really, that's so beautiful. <laughs> but you know, you said it, so you know, it really was awesome. Um, that's where I am right now, is I'm looking for my literary soulmate. Uh, and, well, maybe uh, one's listening, maybe one's listening today. <laughs> absolutely, you know, or somebody who knows like this amazing, so the book is really, it's very practical about how do you get through the different stages? How do you get through the initial shock? Mm -hmm. How do you sort of get yourself back on your feet? How do you manage the day to day? And then how do you grow from this? Because I believe that we all can find nuggets in a crisis. To me, it's sort of like panning for gold. You know, you get this whole pan full of stuff and, and some of it's dross and some of it's nuggets and you have to, you have to look for the nuggets to find them, right. but you can. And my hope with the book is that people will find it as almost like a resource guide. You know, I'm right now, I just found out I have cancer or a loved one has cancer. What can I do? How do I get grounded? How do I get back into my body? How do I move forward? Or how do I build a community of support? How do I not use the internet? You know, what's, what's a, what are the things I want to avoid on the internet? WebMD? <laughs> yes, WebMD. Yes. I had it when Vita was in the hospital, he had a rash. The doctor said, well, you know, you might have this really bad rash called Johnson Stevens. And, and so I did not look it up. A really bad rash didn't sound like a good thing I should look at. No. And the next day he came in and he go, did you look that up? I said, no. He goes, well, that's really good because he doesn't have it. And it would have really scared you. I'm thinking, then don't tell me this stuff. Right, <laughs> right, right. Uh -huh. Yeah, so don't look up WebMD because it's really, really scary. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's lots of different ways that I'm hoping people could dip into this book and mm -hmm. find sort of wisdom, affirmations, resources, stories that they go, oh my gosh, I went through that too, or, you know, that gives me an idea. 
and my hope is that it, it helps people on their journey. And that's, that's what it's being written for. I'm also starting to work with therapists a little bit to share these ideas so that they can help. It's a way to multiply it. Great. Teaching what I've learned to therapists so they can help their clients. Great, great. Um, it's, it's so, this episode is so timely because as I, as I told you just before we started, um, my, someone I love very, very deeply was just diagnosed yesterday with, with lymphoma. So, um, so I, I am so appreciative for all of the wisdom that you're sharing, um, because I'm still in that, in that early stage of just sort of being shocked and, and, and adjusting, digesting the information. And, yeah. uh, and so, uh, I, I, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for being on our show today and for sharing your experience so gracefully, so eloquently and, uh, and, and for, sh- for shining some positive light on, on, on this crisis, on, on the, on the crisis of, of cancer and, uh, and, and, you know, and, 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 and showing how you can survive and how you can transform and grow in the process of it. Um, Absolutely. And what is your what is your website so that people can find you and and follow follow the book and uh, and and be ready when it when it gets uh, when it gets launched? Absolutely, it's drsusanbecca.com, and there I write a blog on that. I post the blog. I also there's resources on there. Um, so please dip in, send comments. Um, if you want to know something, please just let me know. I'm glad to share. And, and Rachel, as I said earlier, if I can help this friend of this individual that you love so much, please. Um, send him my way. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you, by the way, if you ever want to talk. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really do. Great. Um, All right. Well, thank you so much for letting me be on the show today. Absolutely. It was was my pleasure entirely. (laughs) Wonderful. Wonderful. Great. So that is our show today. John, wasn't she just incredible? Uh, I'm so... I'm so glad and honored to have her on the show. I was blown away. I know. And I really loved what she had to say about finding her liter- literary soulmate. Yes, yes, I know, I know. <laughs> so. so great, great. Well, if you know, if you're looking for advice astrologically or um, or spiritually, or you're 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 looking for for some kind of a life change, feel free to contact me at blissenup.com. I do offer private consultations and sessions. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm learning how to, uh, how to say that, you know, how to, how to, John's helping me pr- promote that on air. So, so yes, um, I'm really also excited because tomorrow I'm going to have a special show here at the Conscious Life Expo with a Mayan, um, with a Mayan astrologer, Jose, uh, is his name and uh, and I and and right now I don't have I don't have his last name in front of me and it just like totally left my mind um, after all of that conversation my, my mind is a little bit focused so um, so watch tomorrow's show and next week we will be live from a haunted house so I will also be broadcasting on Periscope next week so you'll be able to tune in both ways um, and I'll, I'll share more information about that on Facebook um, you can find me at blissenup.com or at Listen up with Rachel. And my guest tomorrow is Jose Federico Munoz. And he is a Mayan astrologer and an incredible healer who's making such a difference in the world and helping to raise the consciousness, like everyone here at the Conscious Life Expo. So thank you so much for tuning in today, and we'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) 